I'm Information Strategy Advisor Keith May and Sarah Poppy is the Hias Programme Manager. Um, so just to say, what is Heritage Information Access Strategy? Well, certainly it should fit on that, that screen. It's quite a mouthful. Um, it's really a program of, of interlinked projects and, and, and initiatives, indeed, that we're trying to bring together. As you probably gather it, it kind of impacts even some of the things that Louisa was talking about. And certainly the, the work of Oasis spreads quite widely. So there, there's quite a wide range of things that we're trying to do. But it's designed principally to improve access to heritage data that's held and generated both by Historic England and very importantly, local authority HERs and other bodies. And we'll talk more about the, the role of the local H authority HERs as we go through this, because I think that was something that came up this morning as well in discussions as an important thing to people are thinking about. Um, but it's in this context, what we're thinking about, it certainly impacts on digital archiving. It, it's also very much a culture and business change program. So those initiatives are about change over time and William's point that you know, IT does change and we're not going to expect some final magic solution so we need to actually as well as supporting IT developments we need to actually support people and processes and how they're going to actually deal with those changes as well and a lot of HIAS is about that and of course that's important in terms of partnerships with the other bodies um, so the programme's being coordinated, sort of, to some extent, driven by Historic England, but very much a partner initi initiative, and I'll mention partners in the next slide after this. Um, just to sort of set some context, even since we, we've initiated HIAS and got it going, it's, it's built momentum, and we we're very pleased that it got referenced, at least in, in, in concept, in the Culture White Paper last, last summer, 2016, as it said in, in the DCMS white paper, we will ask H Historic England to work with local authorities to enhance and rationalise national and local heritage records over the next 10 years. Interesting timescale there, because as you'll see, our initial programme is really set out for three years, which is partly driven by the sort of oasis timetable and herald that, that Louisa was just talking about. But the next 10 years, so that communities and developers have easy access to historic environment records. So we're coming back here to a, a real challenge to support those historic environment records in local authorities. Again, in terms of complexity of this, uh, just let, I won't try and read all these out, and you'll see that we've got ac acronyms and full versions of, of the partners up here. Clearly key ones, uh, CIFA is in, in there, ADS are in there in terms of their role, in, as, as Louise was talking about, in developing OASIS further as a the sort of transference mechanism behind a lot of some of the information that people are, are, are needing as part of this. Also think people like the Society for Museum Archaeology, which we'll probably come back to in a little bit. Um, in terms of the vision, it's just sort of, again, to give background, you know, what we're really aiming for is to provide sort of clarity and reduce duplication in handling, certainly around local HERs and certainly with some of the historic England's records or the earlier English Heritage records, there, there has been tension around and duplication of, of information. We, we certainly want to improve the flow of built heritage sector information to HERs in support of the planning system. Again, that sort of ties in with why Oasis, where we're, we're trying to seek a, a better interface for recording that type of information through OASIS, and that's some of the work that ADS have very much worked on as well with the Built Legacy project. It's, again, improving access is a key part of this for, for developer-funded investigations, again, thinking of the, the sort of information that is coming in through OASIS, through those crucial reports of that work that we want to make it flow through the system more quickly and, and try and avoid some of those stoppages that have, that have been there. Um, and as, as I said, the, the linkages and signposting between H, HERs and, and local authorities, and particularly to the record office and museums and archaeological archives, again, I think some of the issues we're talking about, digital archive in here, there are quite a lot of issues around local museums about what even they, they can possibly do with digital archives. We've heard good practice and good examples from national bodies, but I, I, I think in a sense they're doing some of the local museums that really do struggle with what they're going to do with the 
digital archaeological data. And it's really about supporting the you know, cost-effective access in terms of a national overview. One of the things we'll come on to is, is, is building something called the Heritage Gateway as, as, as an interface and other interfaces to give a, a better national coverage. These actually appeared on screen earlier. I'm not sure in, in the, the Scottish presentation, but again, they were just listed. Um, nice to see them up. But these, they may have been actually... The, the red pen is not crossing out because of the mistakes. They've just been updated because we've been working with partners. We, we set these out right early on in the process, and we tried to actually distill them in a way that other bodies will sign up to. So it's sort of like having a national overview. It's not that the Heritage Gateway has to be the only national overview. And please, you know, it, it's important that we have the right level of <coughs> overview for the, the, the various data sets that are possible. I've ringed the two in particular to remind myself to talk about principle three is, is that historically, and we've put together with its partners, should continue to champion the development, maintenance, implementation of standards for creation, management, and we've put sharing, reusing, and storage of digital historic environment data. And I think sharing and reuse is something I would sort of like to draw out, perhaps in the discussions that, that come out of this session, because I think that, that's an important trajectory we need to, to look at. Uh, and for the last one, the, the digital data should be supported by the material archives and safe repositories accessible to the public. Again, this idea of trying to join up the digital or not forgetting all the physical records as well. Actually, I just also wanted to remember that principle six is it was like such data and should not be at risk of loss, fragmentation, inundation and obsolescence, which of course is actually the theme to some extent of the whole thing, which we've had in there as well. So, and principle seven is relevant as well. Um, aware of time passing, I quickly whiz through this. This, I always put this up, it says draft to be modern. This was quite an early attempt to just, again, give people a sense of the scope of HIAS. Because if I talk about this strategy, it is quite difficult if you're not involved directly. What are we actually really talking about? Well, just to give a sense of Local, the, the local authority, HERs, as those local and regional records, including, of course, the one that's run for Greater London by ourselves, Historic England. There's also a national dimension in terms of the maritime record, which Historic England have responsibility for at a national level, but, of course, local HERs also with coastlines are involved with, so we have to negotiate that. I put the, the gateway there as, as a key portal, the HERs, majority of HERs are, are using the gateway, but we still need to get 100% coverage to get that full national picture. And that's, that's a challenge for some HERs, as we heard in the context of limited resources. So that's something we're trying to support in order <clears throat> to really push the ability to do sort of cross-area, interregional, more interregional research and analysis. I think it comes back to that point about what is viable good research that people might want to do uh, uh, across scale. I will need to leave time for Sarah. Um, so we, Sarah will come on and talk about more of these in terms of the, the idea of what we might do with security copies and again crucially involving museum linkages, things like um, IDs to uh, museum records, those, those um, accession numbers that would be crucial to link up. Quickly again, an overview of where we are. We're, we're bang slap in the middle of this. I don't know if I've got, a, yeah, 2016, 18, we had the culture white paper, and we're in what we're calling the development phase, which Sarah's going to talk more about. So I'll move on quickly. And just as we move on, give you a sense of what we've done so far. We've had sort of the background, the, the visions, the pro, we've done process mapping, which produced some of that, that overview and other work. And we've been working on work packages in our phase two which I think, at this point, I should let Sarah tell you more about. Okay. We also, yes, you're going to talk about the consultation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, we're, as Keith said, we're now in phase three, which is the development phase. Um, at the sort of close of phase two, we undertook a sector-wide consultation looking at the principles and the proposals that we're putting forward as part of IAS. <laughs> To the, to the sector to ask their feedback. And it was a mixture of open and closed questions. Um, the predominant responses were from HE and local authorities, obviously because those are the people who hire us are really directly affecting in the immediate sense of the word. 
And I won't go through the detail of the questions and the report from the consultation is on our website, but the essence of it being is that the blue and the red indicate people strongly agreeing and moderately agreeing with what we were proposing. So from this it gave us a good, a good insight as to which, which areas were sort of, you know, no-brainers and which ones where there was a more of a diverse range of opinions that we could then explore more detailed through the, through the feedback. So we're, phase three of HIAS started around about July last year and it comprises 12... Oh, sorry, this is, this is, um, there were um, a variety of issues that were thrown up through the consultation and these are all very familiar with the sort of topics that were being discussed this morning actually when people were talking about statutory HERs and how we support them in that both it's, uh, we recognise that, that HERs are absolutely central but we view that the highest programme hopefully is um, building a sort of coordinated approach for them to be able to move forward with terms of delivering their, their local services. Um, phase three of HIAS comprises 12 work packages, and you, these are them, and you can see that it's delivered by a variety of HE and sector partners, and quite um, you know, unusually for HE, it's actually a cross-group initiative with different, with different members and different groups leading on the, on the work. And it also gives you an idea of the modular nature of HIAS, and these are all individual projects which complement each other, but which have their own sort of delivery in their own, um, in their own right. And what I'm going to do just for the last um, two or three minutes of the talk is talk through a handful of the work packages, which are the ones I've circled, and explain what we're doing as part of phase three. Principle one states that local authorities should be the first port of call and, and primary trusted source of investigative research data and knowledge. Um, and principle, what, principles one and two are really about establishing roles and responsibilities between Historic England and local authority HERs in terms of their statutory duties and their obligations as identified in the NPPF. And the NRHE, which is a Historic England maintained data set, has a, a long and deep and a rich heritage within Historic England, but there's always been an issue of considerable amounts of duplication between the, the national record and what local HERs are doing. And principle one is trying to address that and deliver a project which will um, hopefully transfer this nationally maintained record of undesignated heritage <coughs> to the local HER so that they can fulfill, um, fulfill this, 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 um, this principle. So we've undertaken an options appraisal to look at the different methods for how we might transfer the data. So the NRHE has 300,000 records in, a uh, legacy of about 30 years' worth of development. And um, so it's, it's, it's a major undertaking. So we've undertaken an option appraisal, um, consulted widely in the community, who've um, very strongly um, preferred one particular approach. And we've undertaken a pilot project to test the feasibility of that approach and come up with a implementation plan and resource assessment. So that's all in, in the next stage is now building a robust business case so that we can, we can take that forward and put that in place. Um, principle two is about, again, sorting out these responsibilities between, between local authorities and HE. And Historic England has a requirement, a planning advisory role set out in the Marine and Coastal Access Act to provide advice in the intertidal and the marine zone. So we have a, a historic, principle two says that historic England will look after the national marine heritage record. So we've been undertaking a project looking at our internal workflows and also consulting widely with stakeholders and local authorities and more widely in the marine sector to see about how we can enhance HE's delivery and its holdings in the marine zone to support this planning function. So again, this will be hopefully a new system, the National Marine Historic Environment Record, which will be branded as such and which will be um, delivering that for the future. I won't talk, think we're short of time, I should move on to this one. And this ties in very much with what Louisa was saying, which is um, the principle for investigative research data or knowledge should be readily uploaded, validated and accessed on online. 
as we've heard from Louisa, there's a major oasis redevelopment project underway, and we're also very keen in HE to embed oasis fully into our own workflows and our project management so that we make sure that the HE-generated work is, is, is available, made available to HERs. <coughs> and in the highest vision, oasis is central to the flow of information from the contractor to the local authority service, and in making the outputs of these assessments and investigations accessible and digitally archived. And this is all in compliance in accordance with the wording of the MPBF. Um, so whilst there's been significant, from an archaeological community, there's been significant progress over the last 15 years in making the results of um, archaeological development-led investigation available, it's been less so for the built historic environment. So we've been particularly putting our emphasis on widening participation in OASIS from that sector by undertaking a project to look at their information flows, the types of information that they generate, um, having detailed feedback with, from them about how they, how, how they want to use this, and looking particularly at the terminology that's being used for the built historic environment to be able to take this forward. And it's been generally positive. There have been a series of projects that have taken place that have had very positive engagement and some useful feedback. But again, it's a question of raising awareness, um, training, advocacy, all these things, and guidance that we want to be able to progress this. Um, that's a very brief summary of those last, of those few work packages. Um, so there's a recent, we've recently updated the HIAS website, which if you type Heritage Information Access Strategy, you'll find, and published particularly some of the work on the built historic environment research. So please have a look at the reports, and don't hesitate to contact Keith or myself if you any queries arising.